astrology the science beyond the dimensions of the known i am not talking about astrology as you understand by the word if we look at astrology as a melting of our pride of our ego or disappearance of ego then astrology can indeed become a religion but we go to the ordinary astrologer and in order to protect our egos we inquire will i run into loss will i win the lottery will i succeed in new business i am undertaking this is what we understand by the word astrology astrology is like the ruins of a great building that once existed it was a complete science once which has been lost and what we have now is only in fragments it is neither new nor is it in the process of construction one great scientist michael gaquilin has been carrying on research on the forces in the universe he tells us that we are not able to understand even 1% of the things that are caused by the forces coming within our experience since we have begun to send space satellites beyond the earth space satellites beyond the earth since we have begun to send space satellites beyond the earth so much information has been transmitted to us for which we have no words to describe no is the science yet able to decipher the transmitted information completely we never imagined that so much energy and so much force might be operating around us in this context let us understand one more thing astrology is not at all a new science that is still developing the position is quite the reverse if you have seen the taj mahal really you may have noticed some incomplete walls beyond the opposite bank of the river yamuna the current story is that shah jahan not only made taj mahal for his wife mumtaz instead he was also constructing a tomb for himself from the same marble stone as the taj mahal on the opposite bank of the river however according to story the tomb could not be completed as he was put into captivity but now this has been researched by the historians who tell us that the wall which look incomplete or not are not the walls of the tomb that was being constructed instead the ruins of a big palace that existed long ago for the last 300 100 years we have been told that these walls were incomplete walls of a tomb that shah jahan has begun to construct but the walls of the tomb being newly built and the ruins of some old palace would look similar so it is very difficult to decide what exactly these walls are however historical research now indicates that not only were these once a complete palace instead the taj mahal itself was not constructed by shah jahan it was an old palace constructed by hindus which shah jahan converted into a tomb but it is it often happens that we cannot believe anything that contradicts that what we have always heard no tomb like taj mahal has been constructed anywhere else in the world a tomb is never constructed like this all around taj mahal there are places for soldiers to stand and for installing rifles and guns and war arsenals tombs do not need to be protected by rifles and guns 
It was an old palace that was converted. On the opposite bank of Yamuna, there was also an old palace which collapsed and its ruins remain as a witness. Astrology is like the ruins of a great building that once existed and everybody claims that they are researching it. It was a complete science which has been lost. It is neither new nor is it in the process of reconstruction. From the walls that have remained, it is not possible to judge how big the building once might have been. Many times truths are realized only to become lost again. About 200 years before Christ, Aristarchus, a Greek scientist, discovered that sun is the center of our universe, not the earth. This principle of Aristarchus became known as the heliocenter principle that sun is at the center, but later in about 100 A.D. Ptolemy again changed this discovery and said that earth was the center. After that it took over 1000 years until Kepler and Copernicus re-established the sun, re-established that sun is the center of our universe. The truth discovered by Aristarchus remained hidden for a very long time until Copernicus opened the old books of Aristarchus and declared it again and people were shocked. In the West it is said that America was discovered by Columbus. When Oscar Wilde went to America he made a joke about it that has become well known. He said that America has been discovered much earlier by someone else. It is true, America was discovered many times and was lost again and again when relation with it were cut off. Someone asked Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde if Columbus did not discover it the first time if it had already been discovered, why did it become lost every time? Oscar jokingly replied, he did not discover America. It was discovered many times, but each time it was hushed up. Every time it was necessary to keep it quiet because such a troublesome thing is best forgotten and put away. In Mahabharat epic, there is a reference to America. One of Arjun's wives was from Mexico. It is called Makshika, that the word that is used in Mahabharat. There are ancient Hindu temples in Mexico with idols of Ganesh carved on them. If we are to study astrology, we have to go into somewhat historical perspective of it and only then we will be able to understand that. It happens many times that the truth comes within our grasp and then is lost again. Astrology is one such great truth. It was once known about but subsequently lost. There are difficulties in the way of knowing it again. That is why I am talking to you about it from a different point of view, that is dimensions beyond the moon. My intention in talking on astrology could be misunderstood. It is not as if I intend to talk on some subject that are discussed by an ordinary astrologer. To such an astrologer, you can pay a coin and be told your future. Perhaps you think that I am going to talk about him 
all be in the support of him. In the name of astrology, 99% of astrologers only bluff. Only 1% will not dogmatically assert that an event will definitely happen. They know that astrology is a vast subject, so vast that someone can and can only enter into it hesitating. When I am talking about astrology, I want you to have the picture of the whole science from many angles so that you can enter it without any fear or hesitation. When I talk about astrology, I am not talking about the ordinary astrology, such as small matters, but the average man's curiosity regarding astrology is just to know whether his daughter will get married or not and things like this. Astrology can be divided into three parts. The first part is the core, the essence. It is essential and cannot be changed. It is the part which is most difficult to understand. The second part is the middle layer in which one can make whatever changes one wants. It is semi-essential portion in which you can make changes if you know how, but without knowing how no changes are possible at all. The third part is the outermost layer which is non-essential but about which we are all curious and anxious to know. The first is the essence in which no change can be made. When it is known, the only way is to come cooperate with it. Religions have devised astrology in order to know and decipher this essential destiny. The semi-essential part of astrology is such that if we know about it, we can change our lives. By bringing about changes in the psyche of the man, we can bring about the changes of on the inscription of the lines at the bodily level, otherwise not. If we do not know, then whatsoever is going to happen will happen. If there is knowledge, there are alternatives to choose between. There is a possibility of transformation if right choice is made. You have lost your way, you have a GPS system, you can correct and come back on the, take the loop and come back on the right road that will lead you to your destination. There is a possibility of transformation if right choice is made. The third non-essential part is just the periphery, the outer surface. There is nothing essential in it. Everything is non-essential. But we go to consult astrologer only for the non-essential things. Someone goes to ask an astrologer, when will, when he will get employment? There is no relationship between your employment and the moon and the stars. Someone asks whether he will marry or not. A society without marriage is possible. Next one asks whether he will remain poor or become rich. A socialist or a communist society where there will be no rich, no poor is possible. So these are the non-essential questions which is our concern. An 80-year-old man was walking along when his foot slipped on a banana peel that had been thrown onto the road by someone. Now is it possible to inquire of an astrologer to know from the moon and stars on which road, on which banana peel the foot will slip? Such queries are foolish. But you are curious to know in advance whether your foot will step on a banana peel 
and slip if you go out on the road today. This is non-essential. This has nothing to do with your being or your soul. These events happen on the periphery and astrology has nothing to do with them. But because astrologers are busy talking only about these kind of things, the great establishment of astrology collapsed. This was the only reason that we remain interested in this superficial. No intelligent person is going to be prepared to believe that when he was born, it was written in his destiny that on a particular day, on this particular road, his foot will step on a banana peel and he would fall. Neither the fall nor the banana peel have any relation to stars. Astrology has lost respectability. It became connected with things of this kind. At one time or another, we have all wanted to know such things from astrology. Yet these things are non-essential. However, there are certain semi-essential matters such as the birth or the death of a person. If you know everything about these, you can take precautionary measures. If you do not know anything, you can do anything. If our knowledge about the diagnosis of a disease was, in, was improved, we would be able to increase the lifespan of the human beings. We have already been doing this. If our research to make deadlier atom bombs succeeds, we will be able to kill hundreds of thousands of people at one time. We have done this. This semi-essential world presents a possibility that we may be able to do certain things if we know in advance what is going to happen. If we do not know, nothing can be done. By our knowing in advance, alternatives can be sorted out and selected. Beyond this, there exists a world of ascension and that you cannot do anything about. However, the, our curiosity is to know only about the non-essential things. Seldom does someone reach out to know the semi-essential and our curiosity or desire never extends to knowing that which is essential and unavoidable, that which cannot be changed if known. I have heard Mahabir was passing through a village with his disciple Ghoshalak, who was his son-in-law also, and later Ghoshalak became his opponent and separated. When they came across a small plant, and Ghoshalak asked Mahabir, Listen, here is a plant. What do you think? Will it grow to produce a flower, or will it die before it can flower? What is its future? Mahavir immediately closed his eyes and sat in front of the plant. Goshala cunningly asked, Do not avoid the issue. What will happen by closing your eyes? He did not know why Mahavir had become silent and closed his eyes. That he was looking for the essential at that time. When Sufi Braj Mohan Lal saw the, the lines on the palm of his daughter, he became quiet, he did not see anything, he became meditative. It was necessary to go deep into the being, into the soul of that plant, without doing so, it would not be possible to say what was going to happen. After a while, Mahabir opened his eyes and said, This plant will survive to blossom. 
Gushalak immediately pulled the plant up by its roots, threw it away and laughed mockingly. There is no better way to refute Mahabir's statement than this. Mahabir had nothing to say because Goshalak has uprooted the plant and threw it away as a challenge. He was laughing while Mahabir was simply smiling and they continued their journey. It happened and it began to rain heavily. There was a storm and for seven days continuously torrential rains fell so they were not able to go out for this, uh, those seven days. When the rain has subsided and they were returning, on the way they reached the same spot where seven days before Mahabir had closed his eyes to know the inner being of the plant. They saw that the plant was again standing and its roots in the ground. Due to heavy rains and wind, the earth had become wet and loose, so the roots of the plant had dug in. Mahavira again closed his eyes and stood beside the plant. Goshalak became very embarrassed. He had uprooted and thrown away the plant. When Mahavir opened his eyes, Goshalak said, I am surprised and confused. I uprooted this plant and threw it away and it is growing again. Mahavir replied, It will survive to blossom. I closed my eyes to see the inner potentiality and the condition of the seed, whether it, it was capable of taking the roots again, even though it was uprooted, whether it was suicidal or not, whether it had a strong instinct or desire for death, if its instinct was suicidal, it would have used your help to die. I wanted to see whether it was yearning to live. If it was determined to live, it would live. I knew that you were going to uproot it and throw it away. Gushalak said, what are you saying? Mahabir said, when I was looking into the inner being of the plant, with my eyes closed, I also saw you standing by, determined to uproot it. I knew that you would uproot the plant. That is why it was necessary for me to know the inner capabilities of the plant to live. How much self in confidence and willpower it had. If it was waiting to die and looking for an excuse, you would have excuse enough for it to die. Otherwise, the uprooted plant would take the roots again. Goshalak lacked the courage to uproot the plant again. He was afraid. Previously, Goshalak had gone laughingly to the village. This time, Mahavir walked ahead smiling. Goshalak then asked, Why are you smiling? Mahavir said, I was watching and just thinking about your capability. Whether you could approve the plant a second time or not, Goshalak inquired. You could see whether I would do it or not, Mahavir replied. It was non-essential. You might have uprooted it again, you might have not, but it was essential and unavoidable that the plant is still wanted to live. Its whole being, its whole vitality wanted to live. That was essential. That was non-essential. What was non-essential? Was your throwing it away or not? And that was dependent on you. But you have proven weaker and less determined than the plant. You have been defeated. Such are the essential aspects of astrology. When Sufi Braj Mohan Lal looked into the inscriptions, the bodily inscriptions on the hand of his daughter, he tried to 
do the same thing which Mahabir did, go into the life of the plant and connect there and see what is the possibility, the possibility of great flowering through her. And because of that, he lent it his, his energy. The, and this was the reason that Goshalak was displeased with Mahabir and he separated from him and formed his own organization with 500 disciples of Mahabir. The astrology that I am talking about concerns the essential, the fundamental, this aspect. If you can do, then I am in favor of astrology. At best, your curiosity goes as far as semi-ascension, not beyond. You want to know how long you will live or whether or not you will die suddenly, but you are not curious to know what would you do if you live, how you will live. You want to know how you will die when the time comes or what would you be doing at that time. Your curiosity extends to events, not to the soul. That I am living is just an event, but what I am doing while living or what I am is my soul. When I die, will it be an event? But at the moment of death, how I will be, what I will do, is my soul. We shall all die. The event of death is common to all. But the manner of dying, the moment of death, will be different for everyone. Someone may even die smiling. At the moment of death, I had mentioned to you about an episode from Mahabharat where Bhishma, the grand sire, explains many things in 11 sutras to Krishna and he says he offers himself. But there are people like Mullah Nasruddin who die laughing. That is an event. But that which is laughing at the time of death is the soul. So when you go to astrologer and ask him how you will die weeping and laughing, this is worth asking. But it is connected to the essential astrology. No one on this earth had asked an astrologer whether he will die weeping or smiling. You are asking when you will die, as if dying is of value in itself. You are asking, how long will you live? As if just living is sufficient. Why will I live? For what shall I live? What shall I do while living? What shall I become if I live? Such questions are not asked by anyone. That is why the structure of astrology has collapsed. Anything which is constructed on non-essential foundations will certainly collapse. The astrology I am talking about and what you understand to be astrology are different. The astrology about which I am talking is qualitatively different and is much deeper. Its dimensions are different. What I am saying is that something which is essential between your life and that of the universe is connected. It is a rhythmic harmony. It is the pulse of the cosmos. The whole world is participating in it. You are not alone. When Buddha became enlightened, he placed his hands together in salutation and bowed his head until it touched the ground. The story goes on to say that the gods came from the heavens to pay their respect to Buddha because he had found the ultimate truth. But upon seeing him, 
with his head touching the ground they were surprised they asked buddha to whom he was bowing they said that they had come from heaven to offer greetings to him because he had become enlightened and that they did not know there could be something to which even buddha had to offer salutation as enlightenment is the ultimate attainment buddha then opened his eyes and said i am not alone in whatsoever has happened to me the world has also participated the moment you are enlightened you realize come to this ultimate realization that everything is dancing in that glow dance is shining in that light so i bow down to the earth in thanksgiving to the entire world and the universe this is a matter connected with essential astrology that is why buddha told his disciples that whenever they attain to inner bliss they should immediately give thanks to the whole world because they would not be alone in that experience if the sun has not risen if the moon has not risen if the chain of events had differed just slightly the experience they had would have been missed it is true it was they who had the experience but everything was instrumental in it the whole of existence contributed it the name of this interconnected cosmic relationship is astrology buddha would never say i have become enlightened he would only say that the world has experienced this through me this event of enlightenment this supreme light is known to the world through me i am not the only excuse of pretext i am only a crossing a cross road where all the roads of the world have met have you ever thought that although a cross road looks different it is in itself nothing if the four roads that meet are removed significance of the cross road will also disappear we are such a cross road where forces of the world touch and meet at a point at that point an individual is formed a person is born the meaning and the essence of astrology is that we are not aliens nor as a strangers join we are bound to each other by a causeless force not only are we one with the universe we are also participant in every situation and event so buddha said he was offering salutations to all the buddhas who had come before him and to those who would come after him then someone said to him that it was understandable that he should offer salutations to those born before him because knowingly or unknowingly buddha might be in their depths their knowledge might have helped him but why should he salute those who were not yet born what could he have gained from them buddha replied that he has received help not only from those who were born before him but also from those who would be born after him because where he is stood at this moment the past and the future are melting into one another and becoming one those who have passed were meeting those who were who are coming and i am the bridge right where he was the sunrise and sunset were meeting at that one point so buddha was also offering salutations to those who were still to be born 
he was indebted to them because if they were not being projected onto the future, Buddha could have not been possible to happen. This is very difficult to understand. It is connected with essential astrology. I would not exist if anything from my past is dropped or lost. I am the link in the long chain. It is understandable that if my father had not been born, I could have not been born. Because my father is an essential link in the chain reached up to me. Even if my grandfather had not been there, I could have not been born. Because the link is essential. But it is difficult to understand that if there were no link attached to me leading to the future, then too I could have not been born. In the golden chain of the Sufi masters, all the masters of the past are connected to one another like an umbilical cord. And those who will come, they are also important. What do I have to do with the future link? I have already been born. But Buddha says that if whatsoever is going to happen in the future were not already there, then too I could have I could not have been born because I am the link between the past and the future. That is the essence of astrology. If there were even a slight change in the past or the future, I could have not been the same as I am now. Yesterday has made me and tomorrow also has made me. This is the essence of astrology. Not only yesterday, but also tomorrow. Not only that, not only what has already happened, but also that which is coming. Not only the sun that has risen today, but also the sun that will rise tomorrow. They are all participants. The future moments also determine the present moment. The present moment could not be if there were no future moments. The present moment can only occur with the support of the future moment. Future pulls you and the past pushes you. Our hands are resting on the shoulders of the future. Our feet are standing on the shoulders of our past. It is very obvious that if that which is below me, on which I am standing and which I can see, slips away, I will fall. But if the shoulders of the future on which my outstretched hands are resting slips away, then too I will fall. Once a person finds himself connected with this inner unity of past and future, he will be able to understand the essence of astrology, the science of astrology beyond the dimension of the known. Then astrology becomes a religion. Then astrology becomes a spirituality. Otherwise, by becoming related to the non-essential, astrology becomes merely a subject of pseudo-fortune tellers by the roadside and then it is of no value. Even the highest science is just dust in the hands of those who are ignorant. Its value is determined by the use to which we are able to put that knowledge. I am here to push you from many doors to one objective so that you may understand that everything is joined together, interconnected. This universe is like a family, like an organic body. When I am breathing, my whole body is affected. Likewise, when sun breathes, the earth is affected. The earth is even affected by what remote suns do. Even the smallest cell vibrates in unity with those giant suns. If I 
If you can understand this, you will be able to enter the essential aspect of astrology and then we have associated the most trivial matters with astrology. These matters have no value and difficulty has, we have connected them with astrology. For example, we, are con we have connected astrology with the question about a person being born into the family or a rich family. Until you can understand that such things are non-essential, you will continue to connect them with astrology. It can become a tool in your hands if you can distinguish the non-essential, make a difference between the two and tell you a story so that you can understand somewhat a little more. Holy Prophet had a disciple named Hazrat Ali. Hazrat Ali once asked Holy Prophet opinion about whether a man is independent and free to do what he wants or whether he is bound by his destiny in everything he does. Hazrat Ali inquired, can one do as one wants to or not? The man has been asking this question for long. If a man is not able to do as he desires, Ali said, then it is useless and foolish to preach him not to steal or not to tell lies, not to be dishonest. Or is it destiny that one man should always be there to preach to others not to steal or not to do this or that, while knowing full well that it is also destiny for the dishonest man to remain dishonest, for a thief to remain thief, for a murderer to remain a murderer. All this appears to be absent. If everything is predetermined and predestined, all education is useless, then all prophets, all saints, all teachers are useless. People have asked both Mahavir and Buddha such questions. If what is going to happen is predestined, why should Mahavir or Buddha have taken so much of trouble to explain what is right and what is not? So, Hazrat Ali inquired of the Holy Prophet what he thought about this controversial matter. If Mahavir and Buddha had been asked such a question, they would have given a very complicated and deep reply. But Holy Prophet gave a reply which Hazrat Ali could understand. Many of Holy Prophet's reply were direct and straightforward because he was not as illiterate as Mahavir and Buddha was. Ordinarily, Answers given by the people who are uneducated or less educated by people who are simple villagers are direct and frank. People like Kabir, Nanak, Holy Prophet and Jesus were simple in that way. Answers by people like Buddha, Mahabir and Krishna are complex. Buddha and Mahabir were the cream of the rich and highly developed civilization. The words of Jesus were direct, like a blow on the head. Kabir had actually some, Kabir is standing in the open market with a hammer in his hand to hit you. If anyone came near him, he would, so to speak, break open his head to remove all the rubbish that was lying inside. Holy Prophet did not give any metaphysical reply. He asked Hazrat Ali to lift one leg and stand on it. Hazrat Ali just asked a question about whether a man is free to do what he wants, why he should stand on one leg. Holy Prophet said, first lift one leg. Poor Ali lifted his left leg and stood on the right. Then Holy Prophet asked him, now lift the right leg also. 
Ali was puzzled and asked how it was possible. Then Muhammad said, If you had wanted to, you could have lifted the right leg first, but now you cannot. A man is free to lift the first leg. It can be whichever he wants, but no sooner had the first one been lifted that the other becomes bound to the earth. With regard to the non-essential part of life, we are always free to lift the first leg. And once that has been done, it becomes a bondage for the essential part. We take the steps that are non-essential, become entangled, and then we are not able to do that which is essential. So Holy Prophet told Ali, that he had all the freedom to lift the right or the left foot. But once he has exercised that freedom and lifted whichever foot he wanted, he was incapable of lifting the other. So freedom is there within a certain limits, but beyond those freedom there is no freedom. This is an old conflict for the human mind. If a man is a slave to his destiny, as astrologers generally seem to assert, if everything is predestined and inevitable, then all the religions are of no use. If a man is free to do everything, as all so-called rationalists say, if nothing is predetermined or inevitable, then life will become just a chaos and an anarchy, then it is also possible that man can steal and still attain to liberation, that he may murder people and still realize the divine. When nothing is related, when one step is not related to other, then there are no laws, nothing is binding anyway.